Firearms are something that have existed for quite literally centuries and are always changing and evolving over time. But every single time someone makes an amazing design, this is usually coupled with one or two or many more designs that are just kind of awful. Sometimes this is due to poor quality materials, sometimes it's due to rushed production lines, sometimes it's due just to the fact that really the designers of this thing sucked, like they made a weapon that really just sucked. Which of course makes this a very hard list to then narrow down, because there have been a lot of terrible weapons in history, so how the hell am I actually going to talk about all of them, or even what is the worst? So today, what I wanted to do is I wanted to talk about three terrible weapons in history and the story behind them. All the juicy, crappy details involving each one of them. Now, how many of these do you know? Well, let's go ahead and find that out. But before we do that, please go ahead and like this video, because if this video can get 3,000 likes, then I will take whatever is the top comment on here, and if possible, I will make a video on it. God help my soul in that situation. Now this one you might have already heard of already, but uh, this right here is a revolver rifle. The thing that happens when you try to take a revolver and elongate it in order to give it long distance rifle capabilities. Which at first might seem smart, but please allow me to explain because it really ends up not being. Now, the weapon of choice that we're going to be talking about today is specifically the Colt Model 1855, but the concept of a revolving rifle is, in fact, older than that weapon. You see, in 1838, Samuel Colt began manufacturing the world's first mass-produced repeating firearms in Patterson, New Jersey. And among all of these, there was an 1839 carbine that uh, did attract rather favorable attention from the United States Navy. So, they went and bought 360 of these for military use. Not exactly a big start, but hey, it was something for the beginning, and it did prove that the design did have some potential. But that uh, goes and brings us to the 1855. Now, externally, the Model 1855 was something that was completely different and awesome. It was just, it really was awesome to look at. The carbine sported a rounded barrel that was set within a metal framework for durability. The cylinder was fluted and set within a closed frame design. The firing action was percussion, which was standard for the time, and operated via a hammer that fitted along the right side of the gun body. The trigger was set under this rifle-style hand grip and was protected with this little oval trigger ring, and it had this wooden stock that was curved at the butt in order to really allow for proper shoulder firing. All in all, everything about the Model 1855 was beautiful and elegant, and it was this nice combination of wood and metal and style, and it's just, honestly, when you look at this thing, it's just, it really is a sexy gun to look at. It just looks so nice. I mean, come on, just, just look at this thing. It looks so pretty. And when you go and combine the repeating action of a revolver, the accuracy of a rifle, and the ammunition supply that is going to be greater than a single-shot musket, you're talking about something that in every single capacity that you can think of for a gun in the 1800s is going to give you a distinct advantage over the enemy that you are facing. So then you're going to look at this and you're going to ask, well, okay, what is the actual problem here? Well, unfortunately, when you are using this weapon, there is a distinct chance that the hand that you are going to be using in order to steady it... Um, might, might just get blown off in the first place. Yeah, let me explain. You see, this right here was a cap and ball percussion weapon, something that was used before modern day cartridge ammunition. Essentially, inside of each cylinder compartment was packed gunpowder and a ball that you would have to load into the front of it. When doing so, it was a very common occurrence for trace amounts of gunpowder to end up building up along the edge of the cylinder on the outside. And then after firing around, a great deal of hot gas would get generated in and around the ammunition inside of the cylinder, which then settles in various parts of the chamber. And as gunpowder was very prone to igniting under such heated conditions, there's a very decent chance that it just might explode. And by explode, what I mean could happen is that the other rounds inside of the chamber, all the other parts, could go off at the same time. So instead of firing one shot, you could potentially fire two or three or even just the rest of the chambers altogether. And so if your hand is in front of the chambers in order to steady the rifle, well, then there is a decent chance that you pretty much just lost your hand. This was such a big problem for this gun that army instructors were actually giving instructions to shooters telling them to load only one round at any given time into this gun, which just completely defeats the entire purpose of it being a multi-shot weapon. Like at that point, you basically have a musket that looks like a revolver. You could try to hold the gun in an alternate way that wasn't going to put it directly in front of the cylinder, but then the problem with that was that it was going to decrease your accuracy, which just made the entire thing kind of pointless for having a fast-firing, accurate gun, because it's no longer accurate. The unfortunate reality of the situation was that the Model 1855 was just as dangerous to the user as it was to the potential enemy that was in front of them. How sad. 
The next gun that we're going to be talking about here is the Glacenti Model 1910, and uh, the reason why I made this list is because this is a weapon that had an awful tendency to break apart as though it was made out of Legos, which is um not good for a gun, as you can probably imagine. But of course, let me explain. Now, one of the interesting things to note about the Glacenti is that this was one of the first semi-automatic handguns to actually be accepted for frontline combat duty. The M1910 was introduced in 1910, as you can probably imagine from the name, and it would see service from World War I going all the way into World War II for the Italian. Italians. Thus, the entire thing did actually have a pretty decent service time, but um, that was more of a matter of necessity than anything else. It, it really was not good. And see, that is because this is a weapon from a transitional point in history. We're talking about a time where European powers were starting to transition from the old trusty revolvers that soldiers knew down to the new and fairly untested semi-automatic weapons that were becoming the standard for many armies. And because production simply at times could not meet demand, older models of weapons were oftentimes in use for much longer than they probably honestly should have been, even when that weapon is a danger to the user itself. And now what do I mean? Well, the thing is, while the 9mm rounds of the Glacenti were rather similar to the German 9mm Parabellum cartridges, the, uh, the Glacenti ammunition had a significantly reduced powder charge, which was necessary for it. It had to be weaker because the gun itself was weaker. The Glacenti simply couldn't handle the higher pressure that would be in a more powerful round, as if you used a more powerful round in this gun, there was a significant chance that the entire thing was just going to break if it didn't just jam. It was really flimsily engineered and just overall lacked any kind of real significant structural integrity. It also had a rather dubious feature, a takedown screw that was located on the front of the frame, something that was designed to allow the left side of the gun to become exposed and the gun then easily disassembled. You know, something that would have allowed for easy maintenance to take care of the gun itself. Now, mind you, this would be a pretty cool feature if it was a weapon that was in fact sturdy, but it was not. Unfortunately, the very fragile design of the handgun often meant that the screw would gradually become loose, which would result in the frame and the receiver assembly simply coming apart at very inopportune moments. Like, you know, if they were in the middle of a firefight with an enemy. Also, there was that whole issue about the ammunition that if a soldier went and accidentally loaded the weapon with the improper 9mm cartridge, like the uh, the Parabellum, then there was a significant chance that the gun would just simply explode in their hand, taking out them and potentially the person that was next to them. Attempts were made to fix the weapon, but honestly, they never really worked, and as a result, Glacenti was eventually replaced with the rather pretty decent Beretta 1934. Still though, the bigger problem was that Italian production could not keep up with their actual demand, and so the Glacenti ended up being used all the way in through World War II, which obviously didn't really go well for them. And now look, I know, I know I understand that we just did an Italian weapon, and historically the Italians are very famous for making really good and beautiful and wonderful weapons. Unfortunately, this is, this is simply not one of those. The thing that you can see right here is the Breda Modello 30, the, uh, the light machine gun of the Italian army. And if you've ever played any World War II games that feature the Italians, you've probably seen this gun, and have probably used it and thought that nothing was ever really wrong with it. Maybe. But I'm gonna tell you this right now, this thing is way less reliable than anything that has been depicted inside of a video game. And please... Allow me to explain. The thing about the Breda was that it was just an unusually designed weapon. It was something that was fed from a fixed magazine that was attached to the right side of the weapon and was loaded using brass or steel 20 round clipper strips. That is all that it had for ammunition, 20 rounds. Which okay, that makes it the same as the American bar, but the problem is it was significantly less reliable than the American bar, which was released over a decade earlier than this gun. It was simply something that just couldn't really account for the modern needs of war. When you combine that with having an extremely slow fire rate, something along the lines of 150 to 500 rounds per minute, which mind you, again, for a machine gun, is pretty damn slow. That's just simply not something that is going to have any significant amount of firepower to help soldiers on the battlefield. The LMG also fired from a closed bolt, which used a kind of delayed blowback operation something in which the barrel and the bolt would move backwards over a short distance before the barrel would part ways with the bolt, which continued to move backwards, thus ejecting the round and fed a new one into the system. The problem with this is that by having a closed bolt, it meant that there was a significant amount of heat buildup within the gun, which mind you, again, for a machine gun is really not something that you want, as with rapid firing, you are going to build up heat really, really fast. This means that if you use the weapon just a little bit too much, the entire thing became pretty much unusable. 
Also, since the barrel moved, this meant that the sight had to be mounted on the cradle, so that whenever a fresh barrel was exchanged for the used one that you just had, the rounds that were fired from the weapon now had a decent chance of not actually matching up where you were aiming, because it wasn't aligned properly. But if that wasn't bad enough, then the worst thing about this gun has to be its feeding system and also its maintenance. Like as I said earlier, the Breda used a fixed magazine that opened via a hinge. The problem with that feature is that if anything ever happened to the hinge or the magazine or anything like that, you know, something like it got bumped a little too hard and got damaged, well, now the entire gun was unusable because you simply couldn't replace it so easily, especially not in the middle of a battle. Also, you have to remember that this was World War II. It was not some happy-go-lucky environment that was very clean. It was filled with mud and bombs and every other kind of horrible thing that you can possibly imagine on the battlefield. So protecting your weapon from harm was kind of hard. But don't worry, because in order to help with the extraction of spent ammunition casings, there was a small lubrication device that was built into each Breda. It would oil each round as it entered the firing chamber, which would help it. So okay, awesome. But when you go and combine this design with the many different exotic locations that the Italian army would find itself in, such as the deserts of North Africa and the Balkans, then very soon any kind of dirt or sand or really any kind of debris was just open game for getting inside of that gun and finding all those well-oiled and lubricated parts. The fact that the fixed hinge magazine also had a slot at the top in order to allow the gunner to be able to see how many rounds were left inside of it just meant that it was all that much easier for any kind of dirt and debris to get inside of it, which would stop it from being able to fire altogether. Trying to keep this thing clean was an utter nightmare. But of course, all that being said, rather than not firing at all, the gun might simultaneously just fire on its own. That is also something that could happen. Do you remember that whole closed bolt design of the weapon that would kind of trap in heat? Well, when you are fighting in the absolute terrible heat of North Africa in the desert, this mechanical issue is sometimes going to cause the round to prematurely cook off, meaning it will fire before you've actually pulled the trigger. This means that there was a very decent chance of the gunner inevitably getting killed accidentally or killing someone around them with their own gun. All in all, the Breda can easily go down as one of the worst LMGs to have ever been made in history. Anyway, this has been Stakui with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know in the comment section below what other kind of weapons or stories or histories that you would like to hear. Remember, as I said, if this video can get like 3,000 likes, then I will take whatever is the most liked comment down there, and I will turn it into a video if possible. We have to say within reason, because you never know what people are actually going to put as a comment, so we will see. But this is the history of everything after all, so pretty much anything is free game, I think. Anyway, like the video. I hope you all will join me for the next one, and I will see you next time. Goodbye, everyone.